Well, let's get and open our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. And if you've been here on Sunday mornings, we have been traveling through this book of the Bible, the Gospel of Luke, and we find ourselves here uh, at the end of a sermon, and I'll uh, mention that here in a little bit. It's a re really, really simple truth. Amen. And uh, I remember when I played sports, I, I, I played uh, several sports. So I knew that. You could tell, couldn't you? No, anyway. <laughs> No, but I, I uh, of course, played baseball and soccer. I was a big wrestler. And uh, I noticed that every sport that I played, the first practice, they went over the basics. You know, you didn't start playing right away. Uh, you learned how to, you know, pick up a ground ball, how to get down on the ball and all that. And then you, soccer, you had to run and run and run and run. And I'm thinking, when in the world are we going to play soccer here? And we're running mile after mile here. Uh, that was all part of it because if you don't have the basics down, then you're no good in the game. Right. And so this uh, portion of this sermon is exactly the basics. Amen. And uh, you may be like one man in this uh, parable here, nodding his head. But the question is, are we going to live the basics? Good. So Luke chapter 6, let's stand together. We'll be in verse 47 and we'll read down to verse 49. Notice the Bible says, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, Amen. I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an, built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. Amen. And when the flood arose, the, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, Amen. against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Amen. It's a sad story when we see the application of this. Right. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for your goodness. Thank you for just a great service already. I've enjoyed the singing, the special, the time together. And now we've come really to the climax, if you will, of the service, the preaching of your word. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd open our hearts to the truth. Yes. I pray you'd fill me with your spirit. I recognize, you. Lord, that without you I can do nothing. I need yes. your help. Guide and direct my words and my thoughts this morning. Amen. And Lord, uh, the people need to, you to hear as well. I pray we'd all have ears to hear, as you said in your word. So bless the message. We do ask if someone's here today that is not certain of their salvation, that today they'd get yes. saved. And for the believer, Lord, that we'd take heed to what you're saying here, yes. knowing that this Amen. is really primarily for those of us that believe. So bless the message again. Use it to bring glory to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, here in our text this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ is really finishing up uh, the sermon that he was giving specifically to his disciples. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, is in the midst of his second year of his earthly ministry. Uh, and at this point, of course, his first year of ministry was kind of called the year of obscurity because people were wondering, who is this man, this Jesus of Nazareth? We know he's God. Amen. Amen. But they were wondering that. But uh, then in the second year, he started to do things that caused a lot of attention to be drawn to him. Right. And the popularity had grown of the Lord Jesus Christ to the point where he had this great multitude of people following him. Right. Wasn't hard to find him. Uh, Luke 5.15 says, But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And so this great crowd was following the Lord Jesus Christ around. And as I've said in previous sermons, they were not all following him for the same reasons. Right. Some were following him for their own benefit. They wanted stuff. They wanted to get stuff. I, I'll call them the cardboard signers of the day. You'll get that later. <laughs> Maybe. Others followed him out of curiosity. Uh, others followed him, a small number comparatively followed him, 
Because they believed on him. Amen. Because they trusted him as Savior. They were born again. And they knew him as Savior. And they desired to be true followers, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so after choosing his 12 apostles, and look back at verses 12 through 16, they're named in verse 14. After calling them, after a night of prayer, he called those 12 apostles. After that, he comes down from the, mount, from the mountain on that plain, and he calls his disciples unto him. And those that I just mentioned a moment ago that were saved and wanted to follow him, truly be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he kind of separates them from the crowd and uh, he begins to teach them and preach to them about what it means, what it means to truly be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, he'll spend a lot of time doing this with his apostles and others, teaching them about what it means. And, and in this uh, relatively short sermon, it begins in verse 20 and uh, ends in verse 49, what I read uh, uh, this morning. Uh, Christ is bringing them through what I've called the, the school of discipleship, teaching them about how to be a disciple. And he began back in verse 20, if you look back there, teaching them. Imagine him preaching this sermon, teaching them. And he starts with the ways of a disciple. Right. He tells them, blessed, are the, uh, 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 blessed be ye poor. In other words, a, a disciple should be humble and broken over a sin. A, a disciple should hunger and thirst after righteousness, he tells them. And then he tells them that if you're going to be a disciple, you're going to be hated by others. You're going to be reproached by others. You're going to be falsely accused by the world when you live the Christian life. And then he goes on after telling them about the ways of a disciple. He gives them some warnings of a disciple. In other words, uh, he says, look, if you're going to be a true follower of me, understand there are going to be some things in life that could pull you off course. And he calls them woes in verse 24. I won't go through them again, but some things that will pull us off course are the pursuit of possessions or being pleased with ourselves, thinking that we've arrived or following the pleasures of the world or the, the desire to please men instead of pleasing God. All of those things are warnings to you and I, if we want to be a disciple, of things that could potentially pull us off course. And then last week he gave them in verse 37 down, and I won't go through the whole thing, two prohibitions of a disciple. He tells them that disciples judge not. I get the sermon from last week if you're confused about that. And the disciples condemn not. And then he goes on to give them some proactive things in verse 37 and verse 38. He says that disciples give and disciples uh, forgive. And then he gives them a parable uh, beginning in verse 39 all the way down to verse uh, really 46 uh, of a blind man, a beam, and a tree, which really was teaching them uh, that the way to please the Lord and bear the most fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is to be a true disciple and not be a hypocrite. Right. And so it, that brings us to our text. Right in the middle of the same sermon, he's concluding it now. And I would imagine that uh, Christ, uh, while he was saying those things to these people that were there, and I, I just imagine it, I don't know how many were there, but I'd imagine a pretty good group of disciples that were there, not the multitudes, uh, but perhaps at least this room, maybe triple or quadruple, whatever, a good group of people. I would imagine that when he's saying these things, uh, just like when anybody preaches a message, you see people's expressions. And I would imagine you pro he probably saw some of them going, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. That's right. Amen. Oh, yes. Oh, oh yeah. That's good. Uh, you know, I can see their faces as they, they shake their heads in agreement. Uh, and so Jesus Christ goes on to conclude this thing with another parable to teach them something that is very, very important. And I would even go as far to say one of the keys to discipleship, right. one of the keys to being a true follower of Jesus Christ. A simple truth, Amen. but an important truth. Right. 
I'm going to preach on that this morning. And so I'd like to preach on this subject. I've given the message this title, The Biggest Mistake That a Christian Can Make. Amen. The Biggest Mistake. Right. You say, what's that, preacher? What is the biggest mistake that a Christian can make? We're going to see that this morning from this parable. Now, we're going to look at this story, this parable, about two men. I'm going to get into this a little bit deeper here in a moment. But their lives are very similar, these two men. But there is one, I'm going to call it a seemingly small difference between the two. A lot of similarities, but one thing that is seemingly kind of seems small and insignificant, but it's not. Because that seemingly small difference is going to make all the difference in the world. It's the difference between a life that is pleasing to the Lord and a life that is not pleasing to the Lord. The difference between a life that stands strong, uh, that withstands the storms of life uh, and consistently bears fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to a life that is weak uh, and collapses when the storms come and instead of bearing fruit, uh, it brings great ruin. What is this difference? Well, let's look at it this morning. Let's look, number one, at this. The duo in this parable. Now, I was going to say the dudes, but I thought that might, you know, bring my respect level down a little bit. The dudes in this parable. The duo. There's two dudes here, right? Two guys. Now, notice this parable speaks of two men. Notice, if you will, uh, uh, verse 48, he is like a man which, hath an, which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And then in verse 49, there's another man. And so I want to look at these. I want you to imagine for a moment, and I could bring some people up, put a guy over here and put a guy over here. But would you just imagine that in your mind? We have a person here and a person there. How many would imagine that? Okay, do I have to? Okay, good, very good. All right, a guy here, okay. So let's talk about these two guys that are standing here next to me. You see them, right? right. Okay, very good. You, I got some purple juice for you all to drink, too, here in a minute. Anyway. Okay, let's talk about the actions of the duo. Now, there's some things here that both of these men had in common. So you're looking at man number one and man number two. And they're both doing some things in common. Uh, The same things, if you will, uh, like this. First of all, number one, both of them were building a house. Okay? Uh, Both of them are doing something that I would say everybody has to do at one time or another, sooner or later in their life. You say, well, not me. I'd never buy buy a house. I I get it. But you have to establish a house. Uh, You get that. And so they're establishing a house. They're establishing a place for their family to live. Uh, building this house. So here they are. They're both at it. Now, I don't know what they're like. Can I just use my imagination a little bit, if you don't mind? I would imagine they're both grown men. Uh, They're called men, so I would imagine that there's a man and there's a man. They probably uh, have a job, an occupation, or a trade, or some kind of means to make an earning. I would imagine, again, we don't know, I'm just saying, my imagine is that they're, they're probably married, they're probably, they probably have a family, uh, but they've gotten to the place in their life where it's time for them to establish their own home, to build a house for themselves to live in, and so they both start building a house. Uh, that's an exciting time when you establish your own home. Uh, how many remember your, the first home you established, right? I mean, you may not have built a home, but I remember when my wife and I, we got married in uh, 1987. I got it right. <laughs> and uh, I remember the first place we lived. Now, it was kind of, it was just an apartment. I mean, it was two bedrooms. Uh, it was in Ocean City, New Jersey. I had worked, of course, in Lake City. And so it was, it was on top of a garage, and, uh, and it was there, but, and uh, it was small, uh, but you know what? It was ours, right. and we, it was awesome because, you know, we, we were married, we we're together. Man, we're establishing our home. We're building, uh, building a home, if you will, uh, together, a- and so uh, th- that's what these guys are doing. Imagine the, the anticipation that's in their heart and in their mind. What's to come? You know, the family that they're going to raise here and the, uh, the children and the, perhaps the grandchildren that will come over and visit, you know, and it's awesome. And so they're building this on both of them were doing that there's another thing I notice in common with these men not only did both of them 
build a house, both of them were blasted by a storm. You see, after their houses were built, I would imagine, again, some time had passed, and they're probably settled in the routine of life and enjoying their newly built home with their family, maybe their spouses and children. Uh, Something happened. Uh, What was that? A storm. Now, now notice that this storm that came upon their house uh, was not just a rain shower. Uh, It was not just kind of an everyday storm where the wind blew and you just had to close the windows. This was a flood. Notice in verse 48, And when the flood arose, the stream beat, beat vehemently upon that house. In verse 49, the same thing, uh, that it, uh, uh, the stream did beat vehemently. So again, it was an unusually strong and large storm of this flood. And so here we have these two men with two things in common. They're both building houses, and they're both experiencing storms. Okay, let's pause there for a minute. And not only talk about the actions of the doer, but the application uh, to the disciples. So so why is Jesus Christ saying this? I mean, he just talked to them about uh, about living, being a disciple, and blessed are the poor, and all that. And and, oh, by the way, I want to tell you a story about a guy, two guys building a house. Well, why is he saying that? Why is he telling us about these two men? I'll tell you why. Because he's not teaching them about building a house. Right. He, he, he could have, by the way. He was a, he was a carpenter. Amen. Better than that, he's God. Amen. He could teach us anything. He's teaching them about building a life. Good. That's what he's saying. Amen. You see, there's two truths about what Jesus Christ is teaching here. Number one is this. That all of us, this is how it applies to us, all of us are building a life. You are building a life today. And so is everybody in this room. We we all are. Uh, and, uh, And we, listen to this, we build our life by the decisions that we make. That's how we build our life. And more important than the number of years that you live are the decisions that you make. So many people, their goal is to live long. That shouldn't be the goal. The goal should be to make the right decisions in life. Because you may or may not live long, but the decisions that you and I make bring ramifications. And, And so more important than anything is to understand that you and I, through the decisions that we make on a daily basis, big decisions and even not so big decisions, we are building a life. Right. For example, the person you choose to marry. Amen. That's a big decision. Right. That's a life-building decision. Amen. The place you choose to live. Right. Uh, the job that you choose to take. Amen. The hours that you choose to work, the activities that you choose to spend your time in, to participate in, uh, how you spend your time, what you choose to do, and what you choose not to do. Uh, All of those things are decisions that build your life and mine. What your purpose is in life. Why are you here? Why are you here? What is your purpose? What is my purpose? Uh, And what we choose uh, to do with God, what we choose to do with the Bible, what we choose to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, all of those, I want you to imagine as they're building the house uh, or building blocks, uh, which they place one upon the other, building this building that you and I call life. You're doing it. You've done some and you're still doing it. And so am I. By the way, one of the big differences between building a house and building a life is this. We only get one opportunity in life. Right. Amen. Can I say that again? Amen. We only get one opportunity. Right. There is no rewinding Amen. the clock. Right. 
There is no going back. There's no do-overs. There's no start-agains. Once you and I spend our life, right. it's gone. Amen. By the way, it goes fast. Right. I, know, I know some of you young people, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They all say that. It goes fast. It does. It, I know it goes the same for everybody. But I'll tell you what, before you know it, you're looking in the mirror and you're seeing your parents. <laughs> and you're like, how did that happen? Where did I go? James 4.14, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? What is your life? I say it again. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. That's what God says. Understand something. Your life and my life is like a vapor that vanishes away in a moment. Psalm 90 and verse 10, the days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Amen. Our lives are really only represented by that dash between two years on a tombstone. There it is, there's your life and there's mine. And so the first truth that Christ is treat, teaching his disciples is this, that all of us are building a house. We're all building a life. Then the second truth is this, all of us will face storms. Right. We will. Right. Whether you're young, whether you're old, rich, poor, saved or lost, Amen. disciple or not a disciple, no matter what your background is, no matter what your ethnicity is, listen to me, all of us will face storms. Right. Amen. Now, we're kind of dumb when we're young. Maybe you weren't, but I, I was. Wasn't that dumb? I married my wife. Amen. Did you hear that one, honey? Let me say it again. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't that dumb. I married my wife. Amen. Maybe we'll get a cheesesteak later for that. <laughs> but you know what we think? Well, here's what we think. It's going to be different for me. Right. You thought it, right? right. I'm not going to have those kind of problems. No, right. no not me. No, uh -uh. Ain't going to happen to me. Right. Oh, really? That, that's what we think. Right. We think my, my life, my, I'm determined. My life's going to be different. My wife and I, we're always going to get along. Right. My children are always going to obey. My family is never going to argue. Right. I'm going to love my job, love my boss. The HVAC will never break down. The car will never need repairs. Amen. I'm going to be financially secure and retire by the time I'm 40. Now, there's a bit of hyperbole there. I get that. But we kind of think that way. Right. <laughs> and that'll happen. Oh, yeah, by the way, if you believe that, the Tooth Fairy, Santa Claus, and the Easter Bunny will be by your house tonight to give you a gift. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Right, right. The truth he's trying to tell them here, notice both men, both of them building a life, both of them face storms and big ones. Right. You know, the Lord forewarned us of this in his word. Job 14, 1, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. John 16, 33, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Right. Psalm 90 and verse 9, for all our days are passed away. In thy wrath we spend our lives as a year, a tale that is told. Well, you say, that doesn't seem fair. Why is that? Here's why, because we live in a sin-cursed, fallen world. Amen. And so we're going to have problems. You're going to face storms in your marriage. Both men had storms. Right. Well, very true. I'm living for God. I won't have any storms. You will. Amen. You will face storms with your children. You will face storms at work. You will face storms with your neighbors. You will face financial challenges. There's going to be things. There's going to be unexpected illnesses. There's going to be untimely and unforeseen deaths of loved ones, of possibly children and spouses. And some of those storms that you and I face are going to be much more than mere drizzles. They're going to be all-out tsunamis. Amen. That's a fact of life. 
Well, preacher, I didn't come to church to hear that. <laughs> well, you heard it. <laughs> and I gave you a Bible verse to back it up. Amen. By the way, the biggest and final storm you're going to face is Amen. death. Amen. <laughs> Google. Google. Trying to solve death. Google's going to do it. Hey, we have AI. No, you're not. You're right. No, you're not. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, Amen. but after this the judgment. Right. Listen, there is a storm ahead for me and you, for all of us, barring the rapture. I get Amen. that. But you and I are going to face uh, death, right. every one of us. Amen. Hebrews 9, 27. I've said it. And as it is appointed unto men once to die. 1 Corinthians 15, right. 26. The last enemy is death. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man... Sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. You say, preacher, wait a minute, I'm going to the gym. I'm taking vitamins. I'm working out. I'm doing everything possible to avoid this and avoid that and avoid that. Well, that's wonderful, and you may extend your life and may have a quality of life, but guess what? You're going to die anyway. Amen. You're going to die. That's the fact. That's what it is. And so Christ is teaching this duo... That all of us are building a life, uh, and all of us will face storms. Right. So number one, the duo in this parable, the dudes. <laughs> number two, the difference yeah. between these men. Amen. So again, uh, um, there was one, really only one difference between these two guys. They were pretty much the same as far as we know, and as I imagine. They both built a house, they both experienced storms. Uh, but what was the difference? You know it and I do. We know the story, all right? What was it? It was the foundation they built the house on. Amen. Two different foundations. Right. Let's look at them. Look at the foundations. First of all, one man built his house upon a rock. Well, let's make, since Jeremy's over here, you're going to be the rock guy. You're okay with that. This guy built his house on a rock, and this guy built his house upon the earth. Now, if you were to see the parallel, well, not really parallel, but similar teaching, I do think this was a different uh, time than the Sermon on the Mount, but that's, that can be argued. But you know, in, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of the same story. And he, he calls it this, one built his house upon a, a, a rock, over here, a rock, and the other built his house uh, upon the sand. Now, anybody that builds any kind of building knows that the most important part of that building is the foundation. That's the most important part, right. the foundation. If you go down to the beach and look at the houses on the beach, you'd find that none of them's built right on the sand. Right. <laughs> That's pretty dumb. <laughs> it's, 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 none of them are. They're built on pilings. Right. My brother has a house in uh, Ocean City, and it was built older, and it's up a little bit, but you go down in that, that area, and they're all up in the air. Mm -hmm. They're on pilings. Why is that? Because they have to dig those pilings down until they reach bedrock. Or else they wouldn't stand. Chrissy Smuts wrote a 20, I'm sorry about her last name, that's what it is. A 2023 article for Coastal Homes about building on the beach. She said, on the coast, sufficiently stable support is usually reached at a minimum of 16 feet. In some areas, such as Florida, pilings may need to be driven about uh, up to 30 feet to create a stable structure. Individual supports are pushed into the ground until they reach a stable bedrock support layer. This allows the house to withstand flooding and storms. Wow, sounds like she read the Bible. While also providing a solid support structure in less than ideal soil conditions, such as those found in sandal, co sandy coastal areas. My point is this, without being anchored into the rock, the house would never withstand the storm. Right. Amen. You know, both of those houses could have looked the same on the outside that they could have but the house that was built on the rock watch this cost more why is that we had to he had to he had to invest in that foundation so it cost him more the house that was built upon the rock took longer to build 
uh, I mean, they were, he was digging before anybody saw anything above the ground. And the house that was built on the rock was harder to build. Right. Now, can you imagine the guy that whooped up this house really quick? And it probably looked nice. And he's done real quick, and he's sitting over there as he just finished his house. And he's sitting back in his uh, lounge chair with his lemonade. And here's the guy over here still working and sweating. He's probably kind of chuckling inside. Right. He's probably thinking, <laughs> what's taking so long, buddy? Right. Huh? Look at my house. Look how quick I got it. I got it done. And he's over there thinking, boy, I'm in it sooner than him. Boy, I have my house, and this man is still working and working and so forth. But let me tell you something. This house that was built upon the rock was worth every dime, every extra moment of effort and money that he put in it. And that was found out when the storm came because it was stronger. And that was proven when the floods came and the rains descended that all of a sudden the difference was seen. Right. Amen. But until then, right. Amen. probably didn't see much of a difference. Right. This man's house crumbled. Amen. This man's house stood right. because it was on Praise the, Lord. the rock, Amen. the foundation. Well, here's the explanation. You know this. Right. I know you do. So is the Lord teaching us about architecture? Well, you want to be a disciple, you know, when you build a house, I want you to make sure that you get a foundation down there, and so make sure it's stable, because when the wind comes, you want your house to stay. It's not about a house. It's about life. Amen. It's about building a life of discipleship, being a true follower of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. And what he's saying here, he's saying, this is for all of us. There are two ways, only two, that you can build your life. The first way is this. You can build your life like this man did on your own ideas, on your own opinions. Well, this is the way I think I ought to live. And this is the way I think I ought to do it. You can go ahead and do that. Doing what you want to do, living how you want to live. You can live a life ignoring God, ignoring, ignoring God's word, and ignoring God's house. You can do that. And by the way, it may seem easier. You may look out at those people that are in church on Sunday and trying to do the right thing. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, look at them. And you may seem to be moving along life faster, but you are building your life on the sand and on the earth. Right. And you may get by a while with that. Well, preacher, nothing happened to me yet. Right. Yet. Right. Until the storms come. God have mercy. Right. And the storms are coming. And guess what's going to happen to your life, your house? God help us. It's going to collapse. By the way, if you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. as your Savior, right. and you've ignored God, ignored Jesus Christ, and ignored, not even thought about eternity, understand when the storm of death comes, you will go to hell for all eternity. I don't God know how else to say it, but that's Amen. the truth. Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. You cannot get to heaven through your own ideas, your own religion, your own good works, uh, uh, following the golden rule, keeping the Ten Commandments, doing the sacraments. I'm not a bad guy. You try living on your own ideas. And when life ends uh, and the storm of death meets you, understand something. Your ideas and your philosophies are all going to collapse Amen. as you're cast into eternal hell for all eternity. Kind of redundant. Right. So you can build your life on that. Or you can build your life on the rock. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. We know who the rock is. Praise Jesus. The rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise and the Bible's God's word. 
And to obey God is to obey his word. To obey the Lord Jesus Christ is to obey the Bible. And you can build your life not like this man on his own ideas, his own philosophies, what I think, his own opinion, but like this guy did. He built it on the rock, allowing the Bible to be his guide, submitting to God's word and God's way, and not your own way. This man refused to follow the trends of society. He refused to follow the ideas of fallen man. He refused to follow his friends. He followed the word of God. Amen. And guess what happened to him when the storm came? He wasn't shaken at all. I was studying for this and I thought, it's like three little pigs, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's God's word. And it didn't fall because his life was built upon a rock. Amen. You know, Matthew 7 puts it this way, a little different than Luke 6. He says, this man was a wise man. This man was a fool. Amen. What's your choice? You're building a life. Amen. You are. Every day. Every decision you make. Everything you do. And you're either building it on the Word of God, the Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, or your own ideas. And you may be getting by with it for a while, but when the struggles and trials and storms of life come, Amen. if you're not on this book, if you're right. not built upon the rock, understand Amen. something, your little right. world is going to come crashing down. God help you. Amen. It will. But it hasn't yet. You want to play that game? Right. Don't say you weren't warned. Right. Then there's one last thing and we're done. Not only the duo in this parable, not only the difference between the men, but notice the distinction that Christ makes. Now listen closely here. See, the distinction that is made between these two men is really so slight. Now notice that both men, and you can look at this in Matthew 7 as well, Look at verse 47. Whosoever cometh to me and, watch this, heareth my sayings and doeth them. Right. Verse 49. But he that heareth and doeth not. So watch this. Both of these men heard. Right. I'd imagine as he's standing there before this crowd of disciples... And they're all nodding their heads, probably, as Jesus is speaking. Blessed are the poor. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, forgive and give. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the right thing to do. He's saying, well, here's going to be the difference. Some of you are going to hear, and you're going to do it. Praise the Lord. Some of you are going to hear, and you're going to not do it. Right. That's the difference. You see, it's not about what you know. Right. It's about what you do with what you know. Right. You can sit in a solid, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church that preaches the Word of God, Amen. line upon line, precept upon precept. Right. You could do that and still have a life like this man over here, that when the storms come, your life collapses and your house falls. And the reason for that is this. You heard. Right. But you didn't do. Right. You know, we're all guilty of that to a degree, aren't we? Right? We all, we all, to a degree. Amen. But let's make it as little as possible. Right. Right. See, the difference is going to be, am I going to live what the Bible says? Right. Or am I just going to agree to it in my head? I've known people that have spent their entire life, lives in good churches that, that heard all the things that everybody else in the congregation heard and never did most of what was said or even a little of what was said. And when their life went on and trials came, their life was a mess. Their marriage was a mess. The kids were a mess. The, the, just their attitude towards life is a mess. Because they didn't do what they knew they were supposed to do. God deliver us. You see, again, it's not just about hearing. Right. It's about hearing and doing. Amen. 
You see, James 1.22 says this, But be ye doers of the word, Amen. and not hearers only, right. deceiving your own selves. Luke 11.28, But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they which hear the word of God, Amen. and keep it. Romans 12.13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law right. shall be justified. 1 John 3.7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. The one that doeth it, does it, not just knows it. Right. Amen. You see, we can know, we can know the simple right. things of the Christian life. Preacher, I know I should be faithful to church. Right. I know the Bible says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves Amen. together. I know I should be here when the doors are open. Not for my sake. Right. Amen. But for your own. Praise the Lord. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Be here. Get the word of God in you. You say, well, I, yeah, yeah, I, I know that. And Amen. you know you should be reading your Bible every day. You know you should be praying every day. You know that you should be giving and forgiving people. You know you should be witnessing to the lost. Uh, uh, you know, wives, you know you should submit to your husbands. Husbands, you know you should love your wives. Children, you know Amen. you should obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. I don't think there's a problem with any of us knowing that. Right. The question is, are we going to do it? Good. That's where the rubber meets the road. Amen. Say, well, preacher, I just, I just go down the road to another church where they don't fuss about that stuff. <laughs> go ahead, but the Bible doesn't change. Amen. You're still accountable to God for His Word. Great. Amen. Whether they say it or not, right. whether they pet you like a cat, Amen. oh, poor baby, poor baby, it's okay. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You're all right. You're wonderful. They can do that. But if they're not giving you the word of God, that's a problem. Right. Amen. Hear and do. Right. The greatest mistake in the life of a Christian right. is when we know what we're supposed to do. God forbid. And somehow we just excuse it away. God forbid. Well, if he only knew my situation, what you expect of me? And it's not, it's not me. Amen. It's the Bible. Praise You're building a life. Amen. Build it on the Word of God. Praise the Lord. Because Amen. once your Amen. life is over, you right. cannot change Amen. and go back. Amen. Now the beauty of it is this: is that if you're on the sand right now, you can get on a rock. Praise the Lord. You can say, you know what? We're changing things around right. here. My wife and I got saved. We were adults. We had three, we had three kids already. And we, we were in the world. And as we were hearing preaching from the Word of God, you know what we said? We brought our kids together and said, well, things are going to change around here because we didn't know what the Bible Amen. said. So guess what? Praise we're going to start going to church. We're going to start reading our Bibles. Hallelujah. We're going to start doing this. And by no means were we perfect, but my point is this. You have to get to the place where you say, you know what? I'm going to stop just hearing it, and I'm going to start Amen. doing it. And that could be today, Hallelujah. if you choose to. Right. Don't make the mistake Praise of building your house right. upon the earth. Amen. 